Hello and welcome back to the Video Labs Academy. In this video lecture, I will talk about some practical aspects of lens characteristics. We already covered the basic lens design concepts with convex and concave optical elements and why they are made the way they are in order to correct as many aberrations as possible. We also explained how we measure one of the most important lens characteristics, the resolution via the MTF and CTF, the modulation transfer function and contrast transfer function. Uh, in this lecture, I will talk about the f-stop of a lens, what it means and how it is measured. I will also explain the depth of field, which is a direct result from f-stop. Then I will talk about the specific ways of how f-stops are pushing the limits of optics in CCTV by use of internal ND spot filters. Not many people know of the airy discs, which is directly connected to the f-stop and pixel size, and their effect on picture quality in CCTV, so I will explain this too. And finally, I will touch on the meaning of p-iris in CCTV. So, like with the human iris, which widens when we get in the dark and closes when we get out in the sun, the lens iris has the same function. We open the lens iris manually or automatically to let more light in or close the iris if we have too much light coming to the sensor. This so-called light gathering ability we measure with so-called f-stops. F-stops is a number that is usually engraved on all lenses, no matter whether they are CCTV or photographic or cinematographic. All of them will have somewhere written or engraved what is the f-stop of the lens. This indicates their maximum light gathering ability. The lower the f number is, the more light the lens transmits to the sensor. Mind you, lenses that have controllable iris opening such as manual iris lenses or auto iris control lenses, they still state their maximum light gathering ability by this f-stop number, but then that refers to the maximum possible opening iris of that lens. However, other f-stops with smaller light gathering abilities will be possible by closing the lens iris manually or automatically. So this is the important to understand that f-stop is really the maximum light gathering ability of a lens, the maximum opening a lens can, can give you in order to transmit more light. It is not the only one on most lenses that have iris that can be controlled. This is the maximum opening only. So many lenses will have no controllable iris as such. They only have one opening, which is the maximum, and that's it. This is typically for smartphones, pinhole cameras in CCTV. And in such case, we refer to their f-stop as their only available light gathering parameter that such lens has. So how is f-stop defined? In this drawing, uh, we illustrate this by showing you a simple uh, convex lens, which actually has only one optical element. So uh, if we put the iris blades, in this case shown as six blade iris, somewhere behind the lens, obviously the amount of light that will get through that lens will be only in the middle section where this iris lets the light go through. So, if we now measure that diameter, as you can see on the right hand side here, this is now the opening when the iris uh, is close to halfway, let's say. And when we measure this diameter D, the lens opening diameter, then the f stop of that particular opening for that particular lens with the known focal length is defined as focal length versus the diameter of the iris opening. Now, uh, again, just to reiterate, the maximum opening or lowest f-stop is what is engraved on the lens itself, not how far the lens can go. Usually that is either not engraved or it is known by other means or specifications. Um, the numbers here on top are typical f-stop numbers which for people doing photography would be quite known. 
For example, the one of the lowest f-stops that we can get, in this case shown as 1.0, is a lens with the widest iris opening, which is equal to the focal length of the lens. In that case, f-stop over the diameter will be 1. So if the lens is 50 mm uh, focal length, then the iris opening of 50 mm uh, would actually produce f-stop of 1.0. Now, it is not easy to produce low f-stop numbers. This is to do with the optical design, mechanical design of the leaves that are supposed to close or open. And in, in general, lenses need to be more accurate on a wider section of the area, on the whole section of the lens area, which is why lenses with lower f-stops with higher opening are usually more expensive. They do transmit more light, but they are usually more expensive because of how they are manufactured. But what I want you to understand in this uh, list of numbers is that these numbers, as they go one after another, you will notice some pattern, like every second one is double than the previous one, and so is 1.8, 1.4, then 2.8, then 5.6, then 11, and so forth. And in fact, if you, if you to measure the diameter of this lens, let's say this opening here is equivalent to a diameter of, for example, f5.6. That will have certain uh, diameter in millimeters. If you calculate the surface area that this area has to transmit the amount of light, then if you close this lens to f-stop 8, which is the next stop after 5.6, the f-stop 8 will have half the amount of surface area than 5.6. So whatever the transmission, transmittive area of f5.6 uh, we get by calculating it, the f8 will have half of that amount, then f11 will have half of the f8, a quarter of the f5.6, and every next number will have half the amount of transmittive glass area which means it transmits half the amount of light than the previous f-stop. So those numbers, as you can see, are not random. They are actually made with a specific meaning, which was started from the days of photography back in the beginning of 19th, 19th, uh, 20th century, end of 19th century, where the film photography was such that you could have certain exposure time and then the, depending on the ability, light gathering ability of the lens, you could produce certain amount of light photons hitting the film emulsion to produce a picture that you see as normal. Now, uh, the exposures, as you probably would remember, and if you've done any photography, you would know that usually they also go in halves. So you could have exposure time of one thirtieth of a second, then the next half exposure from that would be 1 60th of a second. Then the next exposure to that would be 125 of a second. Should be 120, but actually for easy calculation further on, this is to be this is made to be 1 25th of a second. Then the next half exposure is 1 to 50th, 1 500th, 1 1,000th of a second, and so forth. So at a particular amount of light outside, if somebody would take a photograph with, let's say, 125th of a second, and f8, for example, then suddenly uh, we want to change that for whatever reason, one of which we will explain later on uh, by depth of field. Uh, depth of field can be increased by reducing the iris opening, by increasing the f-stop, or increase the f-stop to f11, meaning it will reduce to half the amount of light. And if you originally had 1 over 125 of a second with f8, then he could change to 11 f-stop, and then the actual exposure has to extend to 1 60th of a second to compensate for having only half amount of light transmitting, but then the exposure will be extended to twice of 125th of a second, which will be roughly about 101 over 60th of a second. So the idea of f-stops is directly connected with the exposures time in photography, which is actually always double the numbers from the previous one. That way, it's very easy without even knowing any theory behind it, if you want, to just 
make proper exposure. Uh, don't forget in the past people did not have automatic light meters, they did not have smartphones that measured the light automatically, they all did that manually. They could always produce good pictures by knowing the starting point. So um, the f-stop numbers, even though we in CCTV often don't pay attention to, is very important to um, consider when you want to have especially uh, pictures or images in very low light levels. So it is known that if your lens, for example, that you buy for the, your CCTV camera, let's say you're using, uh, for argument's sake, 12 millimeter lens with f-stop 2.8, then um, your environment dictates that really the, light, the image is not that good because it's very low light. The first thing you should do without doing anything else, you don't have to change the camera. All you do is change the lens. If you find a lens that is f2 for the same focal length of 12 millimeters, that will transmit twice the amount of light than f2.8. Similarly, if you get the even better, f1.4 of 12 millimeter lens, so produces the same image, same angle of view, but f1.4 will have four times the amount of light than f2.8. That way, the camera, uh, don't forget the camera was, will always be designed, like in, in our case, in our industry, CCTV cameras are usually designed to produce live streaming, live images, meaning either 25 frames per second or 30 frames per second. So we really don't want to change the frames. We don't want to have lower frame rate uh, in order to go to integration mode. We want to keep 30 frames per second. And if we have lens with f2.8, but the light is not sufficient to, for a good picture for that camera and for that lens, the first thing to do before we change the camera maybe to a better one with a lower light capability, we can change the lens to f2, f1.4 and thus indirectly increase the amount of light coming onto the camera, still producing 30 frames per second. So this is the importance of f-stop. F-stop is light gathering ability of a lens. The lower the number, the more light will be transmitted. And the limit is what is engraved on the lens. The limiting lowest number of f-stop you can get, which is the maximum light gathering ability, would be one of these numbers on the left hand side. Could be the f2.8, 2, 1.4, and in some instances you may even have lenses with f1.0, especially if the lens is, let's say, designed with good quality, aspherical elements in there, they will allow for a bit more light gathering ability and still preserving the good quality image. So, in essence, this is the, the uh, meaning of f-stop. It's simply light gathering ability, but is direct ratio between the focal length and the diameter of the uh, iris opening. Okay, so I think now it's clear. You need to choose a lens with as low f-stop number as possible for the given focal length to cover the angle of view that you want. But I also would like to clarify and make you aware of the f-stop in regards to zoom lenses as well as varifocal lenses. So let's, for example, uh, um, uh, assume we are having a zoom lens of 11.5 to 69 millimeters with f-stop of 1.4. Now, every zoom lens or even varifocal lens when you, when you see the uh, written or stamped or engraved uh, f-stop, it always refers to the lowest, shortest focal length. So in other words, a zoom lens of 11.5 mil to 69 with f-stop of 1.4, that f1.4 refers only to the 11.5 millimeters. As you're zooming in, because the formula said the f-stop is defined with focal length versus the diameter of the iris opening. As you're zooming in, focal length increases, but you're not changing the actual uh, maximum opening of the lens. Uh, that means the f-stop, the maximum light gathering ability of the zoom lens, will reduce as the focal length increases without you changing anything other than zooming in. So uh, if you make a little calculation, which I did here, 11.5 millimeters with f-stop 1.4 indicates that diameter opening of the maximum diameter opening of the lens is 8.2 millimeters. 
That is if you get at the lowest uh, uh, range of the zoom lens. Now, if you go up to 69 millimeters, which is the most telephoto you can get with this particular lens, then 69 divided by 8.2 millimeter diameter brings you an f-stop of about 8.4. So that means uh, when you fully zoom in with that lens, the light gathering ability for that focal length has reduced dramatically. That means you cannot see with the zoomed in uh, end of this lens as good as when it's fully zoomed out. Very simple. It just comes from this uh, simple formula of f-stop. And this is actually a very important um, thing to note. A lot of people when they choose and buy pan -tilt zoom cameras, for example, with very powerful uh, zoom lenses, they only see easy 20 times or 30 times optical zoom perhaps, without even paying attention to the f-stop at all. Now, I would urge you that if you're using camera for a difficult lighting condition, especially in low light, which is typical of most of the CCTV projects, always the, the critical parts happen in low light, in darkness, uh, and you can't f see anything, you've zoomed in 10 times or 20 times, of course, your zoom lens has dropped down the f-stop dramatically as well. So my suggestion is, uh, sometimes it is better to look at smaller uh, magnification factor of a lens as long as you go, you have lower f-stop, so that means higher light gathering ability, rather than have a lens with 30 times magnification where the uh, maximum f-stop is much higher than the one that has got the shorter magnification ratio. So uh, just think about how the lenses are being um, designed, which means the f-stop is usually not changing, it's a fixed iris inside, and the same logic applies to the varifocal lenses as well. So the f-stop there too uh, it plays exactly the same role. When you read f-stop on a varifocal lens, it always refers to the shorter focal length that that varifocal lens can be set to. So these are the key important things for us in CCTV. Now, mind you, um, just for uh, curiosity's sake, in uh, high-end photographic application, cinematography for that matter, you could, you can get uh, zoom lenses, for example, with constant f-stop. They are specially designed lenses that not only zoom in number of times, but in actual fact, they are designed so the iris positioning and the size of the iris changes in such a way that when you're zooming in, you still have the same f-stop of whatever is set for that lens to have. So uh, obviously you would expect that such a lens will be more expensive, more complicated mechanically, optically, but certainly if you are willing to pay the money in at least photography and cinematography, you can get lenses with constant f-stop, which are uh, non-existent at this stage, as far as I know, in CCTV, but just so be aware that that is the direct result of how the f-stop works and why uh, uh, why a lower f-stop means more light and why somebody is going to the nth degree to produce a zoom lens with constant f-stop, meaning uh, it will offer better low light capability or better focusing perhaps. And later on we will see uh, there are other aspects of the f-stop that are very important for the sharpness of the, uh, of the image. One thing I also want to explain, and this is to do with the iris positioning in a lens. Uh, many people think that they can measure the diameter of the iris by measuring the front end of, the, of a lens, by basically measuring the objective, so-called. Now, that is not true and not correct, because the positioning of the iris in a lens is an exact science, optical science, which actually defines the precise plane where this iris is set, as can be seen from this uh, drawing. Uh, we don't need to go into details of how that is found, but I want just to make sure that uh, students are aware of uh, the defining or determining the actual diameter of the iris is not done, cannot be done uh, by uh, seeing and measuring the front end of a lens nor the back end of the lens because the iris sits somewhere in the inside the lens so it's usually much smaller than the front element and sometimes it can be equal or smaller than the back elements so just be aware of that. Let's now explain the depth of field. Depth of field is one of the most important outcomes of the f-stop of a lens. 
all f-stops on any lens have some amount of depth of field. Depth of field is the field in front of the camera which appears to be sharp. That's the simplest definition. Usually a lens is focused on an object either manually or automatically. As shown in this drawing, for example, the camera is focused onto the bicycle. We see the object we focused on and this can be the case even if the f-stop is very low, i.e. the lens is wide open. Nothing more than this focus plane will appear sharp. But if we, for example, now close the iris, which is increase the f-stop number, the depth of field will increase and show objects in front of our focused object and behind to also appear sharp, although we have not focused on them, we have not changed the focusing point of the lens. So the field that extends from the nearest sharp objects to the furthest one is called depth of field. The actual objects which we focused on initially, which is the bicycle in our case, would be somewhere inside this depth of field field, and typically they would be closer to the nearest sharp objects rather than to the furthest away. So in other words, the objects which we focused on is not in the middle of the depth of field, but it is closer to the camera. This is a general rule for any lens, any depth of field. The simple optical rules are, the higher the f-stop is, the smaller the iris opening, the wider the depth of field is. The shorter the focal length of a lens is, for a given f-stop, the wider the depth of field is as well. The longer the focal length is for a given f-stop, the narrower the depth of field is. So typically in CCTV we like to have as wide depth of field as possible because we want everything to appear sharp. And of course this is counterproductive in terms of light and illumination getting onto the chip. The more uh, the iris is closed, the less light will come onto the sensor. And as we know, uh, CCTV we use most often to cover incidents that usually happen in very low light levels. So we always have to balance. But in some applications, such as portrait photography, for example, we want the depth of field as shallow as possible while keeping the person in focus, for example, in order to isolate the portrait from the background and to achieve a better artistic expression of a portrait and draw the attention of the viewer to the face or faces. So really depth of field is something we can use to achieve certain aims, certain goals, depending upon the application. So, how does depth of field work? Why does it happen? This confusing issue of depth of field is explained by what is also called circles of confusion. The circles of confusion are the projected details of objects in front of a camera by having the camera focus adjusted to the desired object and small but different details that fall on the same pixel cannot be distinguished as separate items. This is simply because you cannot show any smaller object than what the smallest pixel on a sensor is. In other words, the appearance of sharp is dictated by the pixel size. As you can see in this drawing, while the focus is adjusted for the green arrow to appear sharp, the projection of the red arrows will also appear sharp as they would fall within the same pixel. Using the optical geometry of creating images, we can see that the crossing lines of the tip of all three arrows fall within the little circle. This is shown in this small elliptical representation in the bottom right hand corner. If the pixel size is equal or larger than the circle of confusion, then an observer cannot distinguish the different distances of the three arrows and all three will appear sharp, although we really only focus on the green arrow. So this uh, depth or distance of what we are focusing from object 1 to object 2 is in that fact depth of field. While discussing iris opening, I should also mention here that some people refer to this iris opening as aperture, another term for the same thing. This might be more familiar to photographers. Uh, so as we said initially, the higher the f-stop, the smaller the iris opening, the wider the depth of field is. This is the first and most noticeable fact about depth of field. 
again, this is the principle that everybody would know that's depth of field. So the lower the f-stop, the shallower the depth of field is. The higher the f-stop, the wider the depth of field. But we also said that the shorter the focal length on the same sensor, the wider the depth of field is. In other words, uh, this drawing illustrates something similar. So if we have the same camera sensor, so same number of pixels, the longer focal length lens focused on the object at the same distance will produce a narrower depth of field as opposed to shorter focal length focused on the same distant object with the same f-stop. So we are talking about same f-stop in this case. The depth of field with the shorter focal length will be wider. Mind you, uh, the object will appear smaller with a wider view angle of lens simply because the view is wider and on the same sensor size the actual object will appear smaller, but the depth of field technically is, is larger. We can now also add to these two dependencies another two, and that is for the same sensor, same lens, both focal length and f-stop the same, the closer the object uh, we focus on, the shallower the depth of field is. Similarly, the further away the object is, for the same given sensor and lens, the wider the depth of field is. So these are just variation of that, but I think that's important to highlight that again in this instance, same sensor, same focal length, same f-stop. If the object is closer, then the depth of field is narrower compared to the object that is further away for the same f-stop. Then there is another dependency that I would like to mention, and that is sensors with smaller pixels for the same focal length and f-stop lens will have shallower depth of field. This is shown here as same focal length, same f-stop, angle of view is the same, object is at the same position, but one of the cameras has got larger pixels, uh, the other has smaller pixels. Sensor size is the same because the angle of view is the same for the same lens, but the pixels are large on one of them. And in that case, the depth of field where the pixels are larger will appear wider. That's another dependency of f-stop and the depth of field. And as you may have thought that explaining uh, the f-stop and depth of field with circles of confusion is sufficient and confusing enough to understand the light behavior of lenses, there is yet another important thing to explain when talking about iris openings or apertures, the so-called airy discs. The name airy discs are in honor of the English astronomer George Bidel Airy from the beginning of the 19th century. He explained an interesting and often unnoticeable effect of light diffraction, which is light waves bending around small obstacles. Such deviation of the light wave from its initial straight line path is called diffraction. Although diffraction sounds similar to refraction, which we already explained, it is slightly different, different optical effect. Generally, diffraction effects are most pronounced when the dimensions of the obstacle nearly agrees with the wavelength of the light waves. When light waves are diffracted by a single slit, the result is a diffraction pattern with bright and dark fringes. Due to diffraction, the smallest point to which a lens or mirror can focus a beam of light is the size of the airy disk. Even if one were able to make a perfect lens, there is still a limit to the resolution of an image created by such a lens. An optical system in which the resolution is no longer limited by imperfections in the lenses, but only by diffractions is said to be diffraction limited. The airy disk's effect starts to become noticeable in sensors with smaller pixels. This effect may have not been talked about in CCTV in the past because the pixels in analog days were larger, although less in total number. For example, a half-inch standard definition sensor of 6.4 by 4.8 millimeters of 768 by 576 pixels 
which was, if you remember, the standard resolution for PAL. Uh, this will have a pixel size of approximately 8 micrometers. If the same sensor size of half inch was designed for an ultra-high definition of 4K video, the pixel size would be hardly 1.7 micrometers, which is indeed quite a, quite a large difference from the 8 micrometers. This is so huge that we will see later on it is prone to airy disks diffraction effect. The airy disks look like shown in these images. On the left hand side here, this is an airy disk uh, generated by a computer simulation of white light with multiple uh, wavelengths. And on the right hand side actually, this is a photo I have taken uh, flying over clouds where you can see the shadow of the plane and you can see airy disk around that almost like a rainbow. This is the airy disk effect. The approximate formula for finding uh, the diameter of the airy disk depends on the light wavelength and the f-stop. The higher the f-stop is, the smaller the aperture, the larger the airy disks are. If the airy disks are larger than the pixel size by about a factor of 2 to 2.5, we have sharpness of the image affected dramatically. Interestingly enough, this deterioration of the image sharpness is no longer due to the lens resolution limit, but due to the airy disks, i.e. the f-stop. So even if we assume we have a perfect lens, with the resolution that far exceeds the sensor pixel resolution, the airy disk effect, which directly depends on the f-stop and the wavelength, will produce image with less sharpness. This is very important conclusion, being proven in many practical tests and analysis. The moral of this finding is that when your camera has very small pixels, small size, high resolution sensor, the f-stop should be kept as low as possible so that airy disks fall below twice the pixel size. In this drawing I have tried to simplify uh, the explanation of airy disks. Uh, as you can see here on the left hand side we've got a lens with certain iris opening with diameter of d. Uh, then we have the light rays because of the effect of diffraction they actually are mixing up onto the sensor surface area and produce a similar circular diffraction pattern where the peak of interference is, is in the middle and there is a certain diameter of so-called airy disk diameter that we will see later on can be calculated based on the actual focal length and the f-stop which is basically the opening of the lens and this effect is the one that actually blurries the sharp let's say image edges. In other words, if in this area, this is obviously simplified, this represents an effect in intensity of the interference. If the pixel was in this area and if the area disk falls exactly on the pixel, then probably you will not notice that effect. But if the area disk is much bigger than the pixel, as I said, two to two and a half times larger, then suddenly you have sharp edges of an object spreading across two or three pixels which actually makes it appear blurry. Here is a drawing that actually does some calculation so we can see that there is a simple approximated formula which says that the uh, radius of this airy disk y is actually uh, equal to 1.22 times lambda which is the frequency of the wavelength of the color uh, divided by uh, diameter versus the focal length in brackets. Now airy disks is twice the y distance, so this was y. Airy disk is twice the y and that is 2.44 times lambda divided by dnf. But because we know that uh, the relationship between the focal length and the diameter of the iris opening is so-called f-stop, we can re replace in this formula, and this is the final result, that airy disk diameter is 2.44 times wavelength times the f-stop. So as you can see, it depends only on the f-stop and the wavelength.
Now, <clears throat> here is an example of uh, a calculation. The key is, as I said earlier, to make a redisc or to make sure that the f-stop is such that it does not produce a redisc bigger than twice or two and a half times than the pixels because then they become noticeable and the sharpness of the image is uh, actually affected. If we take, for example, for lambda uh, a green color, if you remember from the very first lectures, uh, green approximately 555 nanometers. Uh, and let's say we are using a sensor with two micrometers pixels. This is typical sensor of high definition, uh, let's say third inch uh, chip that's close to that uh, physical size of the pixel. So for green color and high definition sensor pixel, uh, if f-stop is 5.6, the airy disk is, when you replace all these numbers in there, 7.6 micrometers. And this is really no, uh, uh, not acceptable for the 2 micrometers pixels because it's more than twice bigger. The airy disk is so much bigger that the images will be blurry. If the f-stop of the same lens for the same sensor is reduced to 1.8, for example, the airy disk calculated will be about 2.4, which will be well within the tolerable uh, physical size of airy disk. It will not visually affect the sharpness of the image. So f-stop 1.8 will produce sharper image, strangely enough, sharper image than the f5.6 with the same lens, which is really uh, opposite to what uh, the logic says in the past. We said that uh, uh, actually the f-stop in the middle of a lens uh, is usually the sharpest optically. But again, this is when we are coming to the size of a pixels that are very small in the basically uh, vicinity of the area this size, then we are affected by the f-stop itself. So be aware that uh, the lenses and f-stops have many hidden tricks that you need to be aware of in order to optimize your image. So it's not as simple as just use uh, one particular lens, but there's so many more details to be aware of, starting from the f-stop quality of the lens, the actual focal length, the actual sensor, the actual depth of field, and all these uh, variables are, are bringing up the, the, the quality of the picture. Um, uh, at the end of this video lecture, I would like to mention one more interesting um, thing about CCTV lenses and the uh, f-stops. Uh, we have something called neutral density spot filters in CCTV lenses. Not in all of them, but in quite a lot of them, especially the one that are like auto iris or uh, zoom lenses, very powerful zoom lenses. In fact, this is kind of connected with airy disk uh, uh, issue. In order to um, reduce the smallest opening and yet achieve high f-stops, some manufacturers put little concentric circular semi-transparent filter, neutral density, so that means uh, a filter that is semi-transparent but equally to all colors, so it does not affect the different wavelengths, so it doesn't change the color, if you wish, uh, which by uh, combining its semi-transparency, when the iris of the uh, optical iris of the lens closes in, uh, does not uh, allow for the actual f-stop to be increased as a number by reducing the diameter of the opening, which means iris closing to the maximum, but in fact uh, achieves this uh, high f-stop by combining now mechanical leaves closing down and semi-transparent neutral density spot filter, concentric spot filter. So the closer you, uh, the more you close the iris, closer you come to the central, uh, central uh, less transparent uh, section of the neutral density spot filter and thus achieving higher f-stop which are actually not purely by closing the iris, but actually combined closing iris with the semi-transparent film area. So this area transmits light, but in actual uh, fact reduces by a certain amount. So um, having this neutral density spot filters is uh, useful for achieving, uh, as I said, higher f-stops when you have very bright area uh, in front of a CCTV camera.
uh, the iris closes in and then uh, the neutral density spot filter takes over which uh, helps in reducing the amount of light coming onto the onto the sensor to the best of my knowledge cctv is the only industry using cameras uh, where the f-stop is done that way by putting nd spot filters in fact you can find out many lens manufacturers will state not only the lowest f-stop uh, which is typically the first and only one stated by many specifications but some of them also will state the highest f-stop a lens can have and uh, often you will find with very powerful zoom lenses especially f-stop it said can go up to f360 now if we remember the definition of f-stop which was focal length divided by the diameter of the opening f-stop of 360 is so high that in fact we are getting into the area where that uh, opening cannot be achieved by just mechanical means and even if it, if it can in that case the actual effect of diffraction will be so prominent that the image will be blurry because of such interferences of light so for example if we take 10 millimeter as an example of uh, uh, one lens that is very common in CCTV um, 10 millimeter and f-stop of 360 to find the maximum f-stop a smallest opening that's equivalent to about 0 0.027 of a millimeter that is really a pinhole needle uh, size and for that reason uh, neutral density spot filters are being used but uh, you have to be aware that uh, neutral density filters um, can also affect the image quality especially the sharpness which is not the result of the optical MTF characteristic of a lens but rather of the imperfection maybe of the ND spot filter. At the end of this lecture we are coming to yet another technology connected to the lens iris and f-stop and which became popular in the last few years. This is the so-called P-iris. P-iris is a joint venture development by Axis Communications and Kowa lenses. In essence, the P iris is a workaround in minimizing the diffraction effect which we already spoke about, the so-called airy discs. The P iris advises an algorithm of the camera automatic iris driving mechanism, which tells the lens to close the iris when there is too much light outside, but it also makes sure that it is not close to the maximum because then it will create visible airy disk artifacts which as a consequence will reduce the resolution of the image. I'm not sure if this algorithm takes into account the ND spot filter we talked about but I'm sure that the ND filter would also play a role in aiding the lens to stop excessive light. When the light falling on a sensor is excessive any iris, including the P iris, will force the camera sensor electronic to, sh to shorten the electronic exposure time in order to produce unsaturated video. So iris on its own cannot produce good images unless the camera can make the most of it. The sensor and pixel size play important role too. So as you can see, the quality of a lens depends on many factors. It is not sufficient to just find the lens of a given focal length with a good MTF characteristics, but also having a low f-stop will aid in better performance in low light by letting more light through the lens, as well as when you have very strong light by minimizing the diffraction effect. Having a good quality ND spot filter and in addition using the P iris technology may help further. Still, the starting point of all this is a good optical quality lens. The next point in producing a good video is to have a good sensor with as large pixels as practically possible. We will talk more about this in the next few video lectures.